Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to the Future Transportation uh, discussion panel. Um, you've heard all week about how um, energy powers the economy. Uh, this session is more focused on how transportation, which is essentially the lifeblood of the uh, economy, especially for urban economies, because of the way it enables the movement of uh, goods and people and services. Now, some might argue that technology is increasingly taking over the services side of what makes cities economically viable, but I would argue, and I'm sure a lot of you may agree, especially in the developing economies context, transportation becomes one of the primary infrastructures that uh, cities have to leverage their uh, wealth and human capital into an economic uh, output. So with that focus of this uh, meeting set, my name is Dilip Karpoor. Uh, I'm with uh, Atkins. And uh, currently, I'm with the central planning office in uh, Qatar, where we are on the client side, enabling and helping the state of Qatar deliver what is one of a unprecedented scale uh, transport portfolios ahead of the 2022 uh, Football World Cup. And uh, while we are doing that, we're also enabling the institutional capacity of the government of Qatar to deliver and run such uh, transportation portfolios in the future. What I would like to do now is to invite the panelists to please come up on stage so they can each also then introduce themselves. Any, any order, this is going to be an informal discussion. It's an intimate group, so I would invite you to, uh, all of you to uh, interact uh, as much as you choose to. So without much ado, uh, if I may start with the lady, um, please. Introduce yourselves and... Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Julie Larnus. I'm vice president from uh, Nantes Metropole, which is a city that encounters around 600,000 inhabitants in Nantes and is growing really fast. Mm -hmm. So we have to take that into account to uh, encounter and to face uh, the next, uh, the, the development issue and the urban development issue that we discussed this morning. Uh, and transport is certainly a part of, of that. Thank you very much, Julie. I think the issue of fast growth is going to be something that significantly impinges on transports, future transports capability to deal with it. So that'll be an issue that we will uh, discuss as we go along. Welcome. Uh, I'm Peng Yu. I'm Peng Yu Zhu from uh, Master Institute of Science and Technology. I just joined the institute in uh, August last year. So I'm kind of new to uh, UAE to this region as well. I will address the questions uh, as, uh, you know, do my best. Absolutely. And uh, I also understand, uh, Dr. Zhu, that uh, your area of specialization is in transportation and urban development policy and economics. And this is something that we will come to uh, as we address the issues of how those uh, issues interact when it comes to transportation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gerard Ostheimer. I serve as the global lead for sustainable bioenergy for the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. I'm sure that the actual lead of SE for All uh, would be surprised to hear that I was leading the whole thing. Um, in the Sustainable Bioenergy Group, uh, we are interested in promoting the development and deployment of sustainable bioenergy solutions to help achieve the goals of universal energy access and doubling the use of renewables, which are uh, two of the three goals of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jerry, my colleague Jerry. Or, uh, sure. <laughs> now that's something that I guess one, we'll get to uh, towards the later portion of the discussion about um, the energy transformation and what governments can do to enable that. Welcome to the panel, please. Thank you, Dilip. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Jean-François Argence. I'm, I manage uh, the new mobilities uh, department of a French uh, company, a law company, which is a world leader in, uh, in the transportation system. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Jean-François. Uh, my first question or issue might actually start with yourself, uh, Jean-François. Now, loosely speaking, personal mobility is what you would call conventional transport from even some since cities have always existed, there has been personal mobility of some sort. 
whether it is just people walking around or whether it then became horse-driven carriages. But what we're talking about now is what is conventionally called the automobile industry. My question to you in particular, but then I'll open this up to the panel to weigh in on what are the key issues in your uh, perspective uh, that are affecting the transformation of the personal mobility sector? And uh, if I may follow that up with a closely tagged question, what is it that governments can do to expedite that transformation? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, what we can uh, attend from the, from the authorities and uh, uh, public transport uh, policies uh, is to understand that we, we need, uh, all the, uh, we need a, a panel of uh, public transport solutions. There is no only one uh, good and uh, unique solution. There is a panel. So in this panel, we have, of course, what the most famous are the, the mass transit system, mm -hmm. metro, tramway, uh, uh, BRT uh, system. But uh, there is also w what we call the last mile problematic, which is uh, the one for, for, for the one we are we, uh, we involved in a new, uh, a new uh, transport uh, system, which is called the Christian. Perhaps we will speak about this. And for, for us, it's important to, to, not to, to, to understand and not to, uh, to forget this last uh, part of uh, all the, the whole uh, need of a public transport system. Mm -hmm. I might open this up to the other panelists as well, uh, in, in, in case you have anything to add, with the, F, uh, the emphasis on power supply and alternative energies and how it connects with uh, private transportation. Um, I just wanted to say that transport is one, for, for North Metropole, it accounts for about a third of its greenhouse gas emissions, which is kind of similar uh, in different cities of the world. Uh, but the issue is that we have the solutions when regarding energy supply or uh, heating or uh, retrofitting. But for transport, we, still, uh, we are still searching for an alternative to petrol because we have built our system, we have urbanized uh, our cities in such a way that we need uh, a car or trucks uh, to move around goods or to move around ourselves. There are alternatives and we're de developing them uh, within the urban area. It's more easy to, have, to, to promote bicycle, uh, to promote uh, walking or, or public transportation, but still you see for the, for the economic sector in particular, for the last kilometer, how do you provide, provide your, your city centers with uh, the, the good and the supplies they need for that last kilometer without going into the city center by trucks? So there are some solutions still to be uh, developed, I think, in particular on the transport sector. Please, Jerry. Sort of building on both of these points, I, I think absolutely we're going to be looking at a, a panel of solutions. And something to think about, uh, it, when we think about urban, or when I think about urban centers, uh, or urban planning, you're sort of thinking about the, the city as a self-enclosed island, which of course it isn't, right? So cities actually, there's a tremendous flow between cities, and there's a tremendous flow every day of goods into cities. Just think about Think about how much food has to go into a large city on any given day. So there's a there's a there's a there's a diffusion there that's happening that has to be literally fueled. And so um, as we look forward and we think about the roles that biomass and bioenergy can play, we're looking forward to more of a niche role. So one could imagine uh, personal vehicles getting smaller, lighter, more efficient, electrified. But if we consider like one of the dominant intercity forms of communication, say aviation, um, because of the, the weight burden of batteries, we're not going to have electrified airplanes anytime soon. And in fact, just yesterday, the UAE um, from Mazdar announced a very exciting development where there's at, at the Mazdar Institute there, they've started construction of a research facility um, looking at the ability to grow bioenergy crops here using uh, saltwater irrigation. And it's actually a very clever systems approach that starts with um, food production in the form of aquaculture, shrimp, and fish, wastewater flowing out of that, 
um, uh, bringing nutrients to these plants that actually produce an oil seed, and then a final purification step by mangroves. And so you have a situation where even here we can transition to away from pure fossil intercity transport to a hybrid between uh, fossil and a renewable fuel for inner city transport. Thank you very much. We have a pretty intimate group here, so instead of doing the conventional panel and then opening up to questions, if any of you feel at any point in time that you want to jump in, please raise your hand so I can see you and we can do a back and forth with the audience if that may work for you. Do you have any questions at this point? Anybody? If not, I'll just continue to the uh, next question, which uh, a number of the panelists have uh, now identified the issue of public transportation. Now, especially when it comes to developing uh, cit uh, cities in the developing economy, or more relevant to here, cities in this part of the, uh, of, of the world, the revealed demand, as you say, in terms of what the likely uptake of public transport is, is very minimal. So there is always this chicken and egg uh, relationship between when do cities invest in these expensive public transport, possibly expensive public transport alternatives, and when do they change behavior, of, when do they note change in demand from the public in general? So this is an open question to the panel, and uh, you may all please take turns to answer this. What, in your in what insights can you bring to how cities should address this chicken and egg um, issue on public transport and the related feeder systems to it? Dr. Zhu, you might want to start with this. Uh. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is kind of the traditional um, urban economics topic that people will be discussing. And I think, you know, the simple answer would be providing economic incentives and disincentives for people, um, including uh, by providing subsidies, taxation, uh, you know, and regulations. The first point, uh, if we want to do subs uh, subsidy, mainly for the public transportation system. We know that uh, in countries like UAE and United States, driving has, uh, has been heavily subsidized actually for quite a long time because the gasoline price is very cheap. And also the highway system, it's uh, almost free. So, you know, it's called a freeway in the US, but it doesn't mean it's the original idea of the term. It's uh, you can drive freely on the highway uh, without, any, without reducing your speed, but gradually people think of freeway as it's free. Um, and you can see that you know, from the subsidy of uh, driving, it creates a lot of externalities, and we know if there's negative externality, the free, free market is not going to produce the most efficient outcomes. So in this sense, um, we need to kind of do a series of actions, including the points I mentioned, subsidy and also the regulations. And for the public transportation system, the transit system, um, there are countries like in the US, uh, we pay for gasoline prices, at, uh, we pay for gasoline at the gas pump, and every dollar um, we paid for that, uh, there's, uh, I think for every gallon of gas you pump, you pay 18 cents of excise tax um, poured into the uh, Federal Highway Trust Fund. And there's also um, uh, numerous states that also charge the excise tax on top of the federal, uh, federal excise tax. And with this money, we can fund the public transportation system. Um, so actually they have a, a branch account called the um, transit fund from the Highway Trust Fund, which we can use for um, funding all the public transportation transit system in the, uh, in the states. And this kind of funding, uh, certainly we can view it as a way of providing subsidy to the transit system. And then the second, this kind of relates to the second point of uh, we should also provide, uh, kind of use taxation, uh, use the uh, um, tow system uh, to kind of increase the cost of driving. Um, towing, it's, um, I realize in UAE, towing is really not much for the highway system. I think we pay five dirhams or three dirhams for each, each time when we go to Dubai and within Abu Dhabi we don't pay any tolls. This is quite similar situation to the US where you don't pay um, tolls in most of the highways, uh, interstate highways. And the toll system uh, can kind of, um, I would say, 
differentiate between people's time uh, value of time. Uh, for example, there are HOT lanes uh, currently being constructed or converted from HOV to high occupancy toll lanes in Southern California, including San Diego. I, I was just traveling over there a month ago, and some of the high occupancy uh, vehicle lanes, now you actually can pay a toll to go, on these, um, to go on these lanes during peak hours, and they could be using dynamic pricing models to charge you a different fee depending on the time that you are using the HOT lane. And if you don't want to pay the, uh, to pay the toll, you can still use the regular lanes, but you know, it's just going to be slower traffic. That gives people opportunities and uh, alternatives you know, to be using these different lanes. And then the last point I think is relates more about the regulation. Uh, regulation, we can think about, for example, parking. Um, there are cities that um, still pro providing uh, a lot of free parking, street parking. Mm -hmm. And there are places like in Manhattan area, you pay quite a lot for parking there over a day. And I think gradually um, a lot of the uh, apartment, and this kind of relates to real estate development and urban planning as well. Um, previously in a lot of the cities, uh, we have the minimum parking standards for, uh, for these uh, uh, apartment constructions, meaning that if you build a two-bedroom apartment, you have to provide at least uh, two parking spaces. But now some cities are actually thinking more smart. They change the standards to be max maximum parking standards. Uh, if you are building a one-bedroom or two-bedroom uh, apartment, the most parking spaces you can provide is one parking space. Well, certainly that kind of, a lot of real estate developers doesn't like the idea, but it restricts parking so yeah. that the demand for driving can be kind of reduced. And I leave that. Uh, no, I appreciate that. I think a lot of the, <clears throat> uh, the points you've raised um, address the, if you were to use the loose analogy of carrot and stick kind of measures to uh, encourage exactly. behavior change. It focuses on the regulatory or the control side if I may point the same question to Julie, who's now dealing with a city which is fast growing, so it's more about capturing those early behaviors before they may have been entrenched. So what may be some of the carrot side of this managing demand for transport, which is less on punitive uh, approaches, but maybe more on encouragement? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, the whole, the whole, um the whole fact that cities are a key uh, actor in tackling climate change is that they can act, such as on public transport, but they can try to influence the behavior of people living in its city. I think that's the major point of the city. It has been raised uh, this morning as well, is how can you make people, uh, not only the city smart, but the people smart as well in, the, in their behavior. Uh, it is clear that for us, uh, for the transport, we don't want to have a punitive approach. So we don't uh, want to restrict uh, more uh, the car from the city. But uh, we have a different approach because in France we have, uh, we have the luxury of having a big country. So having a lot of space to urbanize. Hence we have uh, uh, a lot of areas that are just a bit on the American, uh, based on the American um, model, that we have big malls on the outskirts mm -hmm. of the cities, and the, the cities are expanding. So what we're doing, we're really rethinking globally uh, the urban planning agenda of our city, and thus we are restricting, so we can't really construct uh, on areas that haven't been urbanized yet. Uh, and uh, we can densify because we have cities that are growing older with buildings that are less efficient, energy mm. efficient. So we can rebuild the city on the city. Uh, we have uh, particular clauses that we're trying to put in to say uh, whether when we have, when you want to build a new area, you have to have it linked by uh, public transport. So that it's, it, because it wasn't, uh, beforehand it wasn't a, a logical system. We would just build a new area and build a new road to go there. And so to reverse the logic and say you, can't, you cannot build a new area if it is not linked to pu public transport and thus densify our city. So it's, we kind of try to reverse uh, the thinking because we have, uh, we, we were one of the first cities in France to reinstore the, tr the, tr uh, the, tram the trolley. 
yeah, the tram, yeah. tramway. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have been developing fast, and our public transport is very costly, in fact, for, mm -hmm. uh, for, the, the, for our local government. Uh, and it is expanding because there is more and more demand. So uh, we need to uh, address that question by giving, providing a high, high quality service because if the public transport is not of a high quality service, people will uh, tend to use it less. And then we have to uh, move to the other things, that is uh, to expand the bicycle tracks and uh, the walking uh, to be able, and we are, uh, just the last point, we are also reducing the speed limits within the city mm -hmm. and proving that it is, uh, it is healthier, uh, less costly, and quicker to go by another um, means of transport than by car. Thank you. If, if, if we look around, so if we look around it in a more developing country context, if we look at um, some of the bigger cities in Africa, Delhi, uh, Manila, et cetera, um, when I think of transport, I think of um, both sort of formal public transportation mm -hmm. in the form of diesel buses. And then I also think of the very um, informal transportation, the, the sort of the, the minivans that you see just packed with people, transporting people on their long commutes. And again, I think these are largely, largely diesel driven. I think um, I'm going to be a little uh, provocative here. I'm going to say that, you know, given the emissions, given the, both the particulate uh, black carbon um, and uh, fossil carbon dioxide emissions that there's probably a genuine opportunity for uh, tapping into some of the emerging um, climate financial instruments to decarbonize this mm -hmm. sector by having cities transition to perhaps an electric tram on the surface or even um, an underground at some point. And I, I'm curious, I would be, it would be fascinating to know if there's any cities that are actually looking to tap into the, the Green Climate Fund to do that. And then as an intermediate step, one could imagine um, leveraging the fact that uh, buses and public transportation use a central fueling facility to convert them to cleaner fuels. And these cleaner fuels can take many different shapes. It could be compressed natural gas. Um, Scania actually has a um, large engine, a bus engine that runs on 95% ethanol and emissions basically is water and uh, very low particulate emissions. It still emits carbon dioxide, but if it's renewable ethanol, then uh, you have a cleaner, then you are achieving two goals at the same time. So I, I think that, um, I think a major challenge facing a developing country context is transitioning their formal and informal uh, surface transport into a lower carbon model initially, mm -hmm. and then maybe into a electrified public utility, uh, or, or, sorry, that's the wrong word, but an electrified um, uh, mass public transit system yes. later. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Please, uh, well, could we get a microphone here, please? Just a quick question. Um, one of the things that uh, I think London has done very well, and you see it in Boston and elsewhere in the States, is Zipcar, sharing cars. I mean, this is how we go to electric cars in cities very easily. And quite honestly, you know, when you lived in London, you didn't need to own a car. The car was just outside mm. your flat. You just put your iPhone by the window, and away you go. Yeah, I mean, it would be great to, to figure out how to transition that in a developing country context. I don't know what the solution, but there's probably is. Their informal transport is very, um, I'm mm -hmm. sure it's not particularly efficient. And having a, a, an IT, but everybody has a phone. So having some sort of IT connection to that might make it as a first step to make it more efficient. If I may uh, jump in on this as well, there is the um, idea of getting efficiencies and operational efficiencies from what you would call conventional transport and cars and converting electric, uh, cars to electric cars because there's a preference for cars, which is a behavioral trait, is something that is an incremental change, a pragmatic but nonetheless an incremental change, which is necessary. But on the other side are the more expensive, heavily capital expense oriented but still the backbone of this behavior change, like the rail-oriented public transport, whether they are metros, the regional rail discussions. Aviation was one thing Jerry mentioned. So 
the topic that we're talking about is travel demand management as to how do people go about doing conventional travel and how does the energy transformation enable people to move differently. The point, without having, I don't know if that's an, there was a question in your, uh, in your comment. It sounded like there was an observation. Yes. And this is our point about public transport, that it's shared. And in an urban environment, we have to be in a shared public space. Okay, there's an amount of situations when, you know, if you live outside of the city and you've got a big family, but if you live in a densely urban area, to be honest, you do not need to own a motor car today. The technology is there, mm. it saves money, parking, you know, all the issues that we have to deal with. This is how we transition quickly to electric vehicles in, in the larger cities. Anyway, that's just an opinion. No, I appreciate that, yeah. yeah. Uh, th there was an issue there which I might want to just underplay because we're talking about transport, but transport is a subset of a much wider issue with cities, which is how do we develop? Uh, a couple of our panelists, both Julie and uh, Dr. Zhu, touched upon the notion of land use planning because effectively, primary assets that cities have is land and space. So the way that space is managed through regulatory control over whether it was housing policies or just development policies is what creates the shape of the city and the transport infrastructure then kind of holds it together as a backbone to enable the kinds of, um, let's say, opportunistic movements that you were talking about. Technology is important and that's an evolving place, but I personally believe that the, the pragmatic solution-oriented space is a hybrid of optimal public transport, which then has a nested series of um, integrated uh, alternative modes. A number of, uh, um, I think uh, Jean-Francois talked about some of the um, electric vehicle opportunities for the last mile, which connect up with that system, and then using technology to leverage off of it. But I appreciate the comment on this. Uh, there was a question here, if I don't see clearly. I think uh, London is a very good example of providing a very good public sector transportation. So if you want to get away from private cars, you need to provide that first. And the difficulty is the investment required, irrespective of the land use, whatever it is, is actually having a reliable service that provides it to you similar to the car. It doesn't have to be this, you know, exactly that, but similar to the car. And that will be a transition for us. So examples, uh, Hong Kong as well, Singapore and so forth. These are the cities that are transi transitioning from uh, the car to a public transport mm -hmm. arena. Can I address this? Please. I think this goes back to uh, your question pretty well. Because again, this is really the demand and supply side. Um, as going back to my points of incentives and disincentives, I think London and even Boston is kind of different. Boston is in the US is considered as one of the for transit uh, heritage cities. It, it, it was built uh, like with a, one um, center, urban center kind of um, like centric uh, kind of circle. But in a lot of cities in the US, the um, problem with people's behavior is that driving is so cheap. And even though public transit agencies have been trying to providing um, very good services, people don't want to use it because that's exactly because Driving is cheap and driving is subsidized. They use their car. When I was living in Los Angeles, I had a zip car just parked underneath my apartment, you know, on the street. It's street parking as well. Sometimes I complain it's taking my spot because I usually park there. But like two years later, the city dedicated that spot for zip car. And I don't see a lot of people are using it. I don't use it very often because, you know, first it's a reliability issue. And because sometimes you don't find a zip car when you want to use it then you mess up your appointment, and then you have to take a taxi. And the second point is, if I own my own car, um, parking in Los Angeles is not that much. I, th I think I pay $100 a month for parking in the uh, downtown area for my apartment, but in other places it can be much more than that. Then people might be thinking about, okay, I maybe need to give up my car and use public transit more often. So it's again, the, the, it's really the, the incentive and disincentive points of view. And I think it's really great for cities and government to provide alternatives for people whoever wants to use the zip car or electricity car or public transportation. 
But the bottom line is we also need to think about how we can change people's behavior. Mm -hmm. I yes, just want to add a point uh, and to answer to your question before. I think we can, uh, government or, or, or local government can, uh, can be punitive, can have punitive uh, policy uh -huh. if they propose a high performances uh, public transport solution. That's what some, some of the cities as Nantes or Strasbourg in France has, has done uh, with success. Uh, so it was, you're right, uh, if uh, it's cheap to, to take its own car. Uh, if it's faster, uh, even if you, you have a high performances or the family network, modern, mm -hmm. etc., comfortable, mm -hmm. uh, people will continue to take a pri pri private car uh, because it's easier and cheaper. But if it began to be complicated, uh, expensive, no place, no public place in the center of the city, they will say, okay, I will take the alternative. It seems to be uh, uh, fast and comfortable. So uh, I think we can. They're, they're, Two conditions, the alternative, which has to be successful, but also perhaps sometimes uh, local policy has to be, to be ambitious mm -hmm. at this point. I think the point of ambition is taken very well, especially in this part of the world where a lot of the cities uh, and uh, countries are leading by example by setting not only very aggressive targets uh, in terms of whether it's the Expo in Dubai or whether it's the World Cup in Qatar or events like this here in Abu Dhabi, the emphasis on tailoring these kind of global um, thought leadership discussions into a local action space is something that is increasingly being felt, and that is only a good thing. So thank you for that. Julie, it looks like you want to add something to this. I, I, I just wanted to add, um, because there are two issues at stake. There's one option that is we're, we don't rethink our way of uh, moving, uh, and we still use the car, but we just put something else into it than petrol. So we go to ele ele electric uh, vehicles. Or there is behavioral change. That is, uh, we go to another way of uh, thinking how to move ourselves. And I just wanted to give a note of hope because um, I'm half Dutch. And in Holland, you all may think that we were born on bikes. <laughs> for me, it's, it's a fact. But for the generation before me, it wasn't. It was, really an imp uh, uh, it was really the national government who said, well, uh, either we uh, go for nuclear power again or we rethink uh, our energy system. And so we look into a different way of transportation. But that means that we have everything we need uh, in our compounds and we can do everything by bike. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add uh, just one, one last thing because you uh, launched, uh, you, you introduced it well, it is that uh, we do need as local governments to act more together and all the non-state actors, because we talked about UN Habitat this morning, we talked about um, COP21 and what it gives as an incentive uh, for the local actors to act, because we are key actors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just wanted to say that we, uh, in Nantes are uh, building the first uh, global summit on uh, climate action that is called Climate Chance at the end of September and I uh, have some leaflets so if you want because I think uh, what we need to do is uh, get this dynamic between uh, actors to create solutions to exchange because there are some things we can do uh, and we need more cooperation between uh, cities uh, in the northern part and in the south. Uh, that's one part of the Convention of Mayors that was raised uh, before. That's the Pact of the Mayors uh, at the European level. Uh, and we have a new Convention of Mayors with new targets. Uh, and it includes also decentralized cooperation because cities cannot pay uh, to or, or, or abund the fund, uh -huh. but they can exchange on how uh, to uh, do the urban planning or um, on some energy solutions. They can provide uh, for other cities in the south. Again, uh, looks like there's a couple of questions in the audience. Can we start here, please? So I'm Nicola Alien from AED. So my question is looking at different countries. So how do we integrate this infrastructure like roads who are not really well developed or constructed yet? Or also the fact that for electric cars that will be way in the future because they would have power um, 24 hours a day or full coverage. So how do we integrate that into fresh transportation for those kind of situations? Thank you. 
I'm going to ask for a, my apologies sincerely, but I wasn't able to capture the question. Okay, so let me rephrase it. Please. I'm trying to use my best English here. So how do we, we integrate um, lack of infrastructure, mm -hmm. infrastructure into planning for future transportation for countries like my country where we have issues with road itself? And also, a lot of those countries are, are using second hand cars, used cars, so what uh -huh. is the uh -huh. risk for that also? Thank you. So if I understand right, the, que the, the question is focusing on the emphasis on especially uh, countries which are struggling with resource uh, abundance. How is it that they are able to leverage the issues that we've been talking about with an emphasis on development and growth around transportation? Is that right? Yes. Uh, panelists? Anybody want to take that? I may uh, take a stab at that ourselves, uh, because one of the, one of the things that um, uh, what you would call developing countries, from the parlance of the economic uh, construct of that uh, phrase, struggle with the idea of regulations per se. Institutions are not necessarily mature in these uh, cities. In terms, a lot of it is led through the private sector. A lot of development is led through the private sector. So the ability to get the right kind of collaborative behaviors and identifying the key stakeholders in, in those kind of uh, developing countries, whether they are certain industry sectors or whether they are key players in the political arena uh, of that country, identifying their vested interests and quickly translating that down into a series of fundamental projects because nothing galvanizes action like clarity of purpose. So getting those countries to understand that there is a, there's a common benefit in collectively identifying a few easy achievements which then leverage the human capital of the overall city is a good place to start. However, funding will always be the issue. Innovative funding mechanisms, which might be the last question of our session, could be the emphasis on how do non-conventional funding sources and non-conventional procurement and, uh, um, let's say, financing mechanisms bring the right kind of emphasis to these cities. You cannot tackle the whole problem at once. You've got to break it down into its component parts and identify the right collaborators to address them one step at a time. It is an incremental change. Is there anything the panelists want to add? Uh, I would add that uh, something that we see in the, in the international development energy discussions is the idea of energy as the goal unto itself. And um, I think that, is, that can be a dead end. Instead of, so instead of thinking of the road, so you might want to rephrase uh, the thinking where the road isn't the end, the road is the means. So identifying what, it would be useful to identify what economic activity is not happening because you don't have the road. So for example, if there's a port, so in Haiti, say there's a port, and um, you want, just want better distribution of goods coming into the port. I would think that the retailers in the city might have a vested interest in seeing a more effective infrastructure. And in that case, once you're in the realm of infrastructure, and as Dilla pointed out, you've pulled together your stakeholders, then it, it's incumbent upon the government of Haiti to take that argument to the um, development financial institutions such as the World Bank such as the Intra-American mm -hmm. Bank. And then, um, and then my favorite example on the flip side, you know, if you're figuring out the infrastructure um, to, to communicate from countryside to city, so bringing goods of the countryside into the city, uh, et cetera, and, may, and uh, one, one might imagine that rail would actually be the most efficient way to do that. So instead of you know, a, a hub and spoke system of roads, you would actually maybe have a depot and a railway and, feeding into the depot, which would reduce further congestion into the city. And um, it was interesting, because COP21 was this big success, but um, as I understood it, something that was not made overt was actually transportation. Mm -hmm. I don't think transportation was actually pointed to, and yet um, transportation is, is very mm -hmm. much recognized as a major contributor, and there are uh, a series of international activities around improving global transportation. There's this group called SLOCAT. I, I don't quite remember what it stands for, S-L-O-C-A-T. Um, and they are leading, they're a, a coalition leading the charge from the UN to boost 
um, sustainable um, transportation, and uh, they would have a lot to say, particularly in a developing or landlocked developing country context. Uh, just we have time for one last question. There's the lady in the back there. Thank you. My name is Martin Kvevaluk. I'm deputy representative from France to IRENA. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if one shouldn't work to define uh, public transportation policies at local level or national level. At what is the set of criteria on which you are going to base your policy? And uh, I'm a little bit inclined to think that we are not perfect as humans but I'm, I'm not very much in favor of punitive approach. <laughs> I don't like it, <laughs> uh, and I don't think it works long, long term. But that set of criteria means that uh, you certainly have different criteria for developed countries, and developing countries, uh, like uh, Mr. Olsmeyer underlined it, uh, telling people in developing countries, go and use a bike, they use a the bike, but in terrible conditions. So. Mm. Um, uh, in Paris, people might use their car, not because uh, uh, car is cheap. Car is very expensive in yeah. Paris, in suburbia. <laughs> Living in suburbia, you have to use your car to go to Paris. It's very expensive, it's lengthy. But there are other reasons why people use a car. Uh, issues like comfort. Nobody speaks about comfort. Why should we, why should we suffer? Mm -hmm. uh, people are not looking for suffering. Uh, flexibility and accessibility, I mean, a number of things. So I, I was wondering, because we're working a little bit towards Habitat Free, what are the kind of recommendations? I mean, it seems that the set of criteria, what is it what should guide policies? What sh is it that should maybe show a way to innovation, research, development to companies? I mean, the kind of product we expect from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess if there's no further questions, if I may summarize, since, since we're almost uh, out of time, transport is only one part of the bigger issue that cities face. But the key for uh, the future transportation from what we've discussed so far, going right from the role of the private sector and how they can partner with governments in ensuring that energy transformation happens in a pragmatic but expedited manner. Uh, Jerry mentioned some of the emphasis on aviation and uh, what you wouldn't conventionally consider transport, but in parts of the world like here, for example, cities and economies kind of wrap around the aviation sector as part of the primary lifeblood of the economic transaction outside of oil. And uh, Dr. Zhu talked about the emphasis on the integrated policy requirements and economic underpinnings of land use and transport. So. Cities are seen as a collaborative uh, development exercise between people who live and make choices about where they live and work, and the government who manages how their mobility options are optimized. And uh, Julie has also spoken to us about the value of uh, looking at transport as a service and ensuring that the quality of service actually gets to the point where these behavior changes are actually manifested just because the alternative options are as competent as what you would consider conventional. So uh, just in summary, uh, the emphasis is there's a lot of uh, very high uh, and uh, thought leadership that you will find in conferences like this. The emphasis, like the gentleman pointed out, on the need of the hour in developing countries is the ability to translate those uh, ideas into a delivery package. And uh, while having time-bound decisions on how we can collectively, with the power of the people, move towards change should be the focus of what I suggest we go away from this session. And don't clap yet because I want to put one more question to the panelists, <laughs> making the connection with Habitat again. Um, so since it's a UN summit, the idea is, is kind of what commitments can cities, countries make there? And I'm wondering within the transport sector, what do you think is something that's sort of within reach that cities that, and countries could make? Um, and then what's the kind of stretch target? So just very quick, I'm sorry to, to put you on the spot with you know, one or two top things, but this is the kind of thinking that we would like to get out of the session. 
if I, I I, I just think we need to, it was said this morning as well, to, to link it with the sustainable development goals. So, because it's for UN Habitat, it's important to look because the situations are very different within Western cities or cities from the North and the South. Even to answer a bit of that, the other question about, we had a big Congress, a, a World Congress that's called Velo City around bicycles. And you see that the concept of riding a bike is for the poor in the south. And in the north, uh, in our cities, it's more the rich that, that begin to ride a bicycle. So, so it's, it's a different percep it's a perception. So it's how you implement, because it, everybody should have an access to transport and mobility, because it gives access mm -hmm. uh, to work, to food, to everything. So it is uh, one of, uh, it should be uh, in there access to transport, then there are different means and it, de it depends, really depends on the, on the local situation. And I think that's kind of, um, there's one very important issue that for many cities that is lacking or is not doing well in the public transit sector is that a lot of the times they cannot figure out how to solve the last mile issue as well as the feeder system. Um, here in Abu Dhabi, and similarly to a lot of uh, more ex most broad cities in the US, is really when you get off the public transit system, like the light rail, there's no way that you can get to your destination within a certain time. And you know, in the US, people's walking tolerance is about quarter mile. And here, given the heat in the summertime, 50 degrees Celsius, I guess that's going to be even less. How can we figure out a, um, you know, different ways of combining the last mile issues and the feeder system to the public transit system, is that truly something we will change our behavior? If I may add to that, uh, Anthony Merlo, I think in a previous session, uh, very eloquently put it as governments should actually partner with cities in trying to create economic value capture from one of the primary assets that they have, and he was talking about land, and the ability to kind of retain some bit of land in which they could actually leverage that land for whether it's public amenities or whatever the services that are required from a social justice point of view or whether it is from environmental compliance point of view. I would actually go one step more than that and say that the ability for the governments to actually work in a way that the time bound, it takes a lot of time to make governmental policy and regulations, but the private sector has a certain timeline as well to comply on the returns of investment that they get in adherence to those same policies. It is that the stretch target would be to work collectively to identify what are those timelines in which those regulatory mechanisms and the response, the private sector responses to those mechanisms can actually result in sound business cases, which then uh, would go into the point like what the other gentleman was saying, people would naturally gravitate to those because it is the best economic value. Okay, if no further comments, um, then we will move to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.